Like most times when a new session begins, I like to start working from the profile or side views. From here, some of the most unforgiving aspects of portrait sculpture is going to be evident to us. Heights and depths are very unforgiving and the only place to objectively observe them from is the side views. Here, heights and depths turn into up and down, left and right, and in doing so, we can judge them effectively and with a lot of confidence. I find that if there is something we can never quit on or that we should quit on much later into the process than we perhaps might think, it's going to be drawing. Drawing in sculpture just means mark making, either with a drawing tool, on the clay or with a piece of clay. Drawing in Italian is disegno, which translates to design. We must always work to improve the design of our work. With continued effort put into drawing comes a higher degree of accuracy as well. And while accuracy can be contested as something perhaps not as important as other things, like for example structure, that doesn't mean that it should be left completely behind either. Accuracy could mean a much higher degree of naturalism, as we'll be hard pressed to come up with the many great solutions that can simply be observed while working from reference of something real. I have a big issue confronting me here, of course, in that my reference isn't real and that I'm working from a smaller maquette that ultimately is going to be lacking in the abundance of information that we would find if we were working from a live model. In later episodes, I will be working with a live model to, to refine what I have established here, but sculpture is a slow moving art form, at least for me, and so I decided in this instance to get something up there and established before beginning to look for more naturalism and more intricate design, which can most easily be found in nature. One of the things I'm doing a lot of in this episode and which takes up a lot of time is settling down my surface so that I can read it visually. We will often use the word reading our work to describe looking at our work and understanding what it is that we've made. Many times a very unrefined surface will lack so much in clarity that it can be hard to read and that means it can go in many directions. Now this can be a positive and it is a positive for sure. We want in those early stages to have that freedom and be able to move in many directions. But we also have to be very careful about what sort of work we do at what point in the process. If there's a lot of clay that needs to be added over the top of our sculpture, then it can become problematic if we do work on too granular of a level. There's potential for work that we do that won't survive to the final surface and so much of it will then be for nothing, a waste of time. By refining the surface slightly at this point, we expose what we have and I think it can be a decent idea to let this happen gradually over time so that the work, so as the work progresses in width and gets closer and closer to the overall dimensions we are aiming for, we are also able to observe and judge what it is that we've done internally better and better as well. By internally, I mean what happens inside our borders from any given view. You'll often hear me use terms like internal information, and all that it means is what we can see internally inside the contours of our head from the view we are currently observing it from. That last part is important because sometimes internal information becomes contour when observed from a different view. For example, the nose is internal information from the front, it exists inside the contours, but it's in the, on the contour from the side views. Contour can be easily observed and dealt with. We can easily see what it is and therefore what we need to do to it. Pretty early on, I refuse to leave my contours rough and unrefined. You can think of the contours as pencil lines and how difficult it would be to judge the success of a pencil line if the line was drawn in a very shaky and unsteady way. 
The contour is refined and the lines are crisp and clean. Therefore, I can read them visually from a distance really, really well and really, really easily. And therefore, I can make very educated decisions about what needs to happen to them. Which means I can improve them much more easily because they are clean and visually apparent to me. The same thing is needed when it comes to internal information and the drawing that happens internally. The more rough it is, the more difficult it will be to place it with accuracy or to make it really accurate, let's say. Now in the beginning, this is perfectly fine because we are not after that high of a degree of accuracy in the beginning of our process. We just want things to be more or less in the right place and at the right size and slightly at the right shape, let's say. Once we find ourselves there, we can make smaller and more intricate adjustments to size and placement, of course, but also to shape. Without a certain level of clarity, we can't make those decisions with any guarantees. If we make those decisions on a surface that is really rough, then we stand the risk of making many mistakes without being able to see it. Accuracy is perhaps a little bit less of a concern here, as I'm kind of shooting from the hip a bit in regards to the internal information. I don't really have enough of it in my reference to fill the spaces I'm confronted with in this almost life-size piece. However, while I perhaps can't improve the accuracy because there's no goalpost to reach after in those terms, I can improve the shape design of the internal information that I'm establishing because shape design has some parameters that we can work with without always considering accuracy in comparison to our subject. Shape design has some rules that we should follow on its own, essentially. Shape design has to respect the underlying anatomy and sculpture. So while in drawing we will often refer to, to shape design as how the shape of the shadow meets the shape of the light, or how those two shapes are individually, there are of course, and these are of course dependent on anatomy as well, but I think there is slightly more freedom here in drawing that is, or at least there can be. But in sculpture, we have perhaps a little bit less freedom as we're not making what we visually see in front of us. We are actually making what is in front of us. And these two are going to have slightly different considerations. So shape design must conform to the underlying anatomy. That's one of the rules we should follow. Now I'm not going to turn this into some sort of anatomy lesson for you. I'm not an anatomist in any sense of the word, just know that we need the shape design to function with the anatomy and more often than not we can't allow it to contradict the anatomy. Though as there always seems to be, there are exceptions to this rule here and there. So pay attention to them when you see them occurring in your efforts. Shape design should also say something about the nature of the shape that we are trying to establish. And so understanding what the shape we are looking at is becomes important. Are we looking at bone, relaxed muscle, muscle and tension, or perhaps we are looking at fat or loose skin? These questions should be answered and they will have a profound impact on how you approach each shape. Bones will have a more linear nature and a more symmetrical nature on either side of the center line. They will have more angle breaks, meaning that one shape is going to be made up of more lines, in general. Muscles will have less lines, and depending on the action of the muscle, look for the differences from side to side. As you know, all the muscles and forms present on one side of the body or the head will find on the other side as well. So we should look for differences on either side of the center line, if they are there, and if there's different actions taking place in one arm versus the other arm, for example. Flesh or fat needs even less lines to describe them and should also be more affected by gravity than other materials. This means that we will have, if we observe them from the contour, we will have longer lines towards the top and shorter lines towards the bottom. Now this is true for muscles as well, as when they are in tension, they will defy gravity more than when they are relaxed, of course. Just think of what a relaxed buttock will look like in comparison to one that is in tension. The one in tension will have its high point placed really high up, and the one that's relaxed will have the high point placed really low, 